David Williams here in Christ Jesus. May the Spirit of God give you ears to hear. May the God of everything give you ears to hear what he is saying to the churches because Jesus is speaking to the faithful. He's also speaking to the unfaithful to steer the unfaithful to faithfulness. He's speaking to the faithful to ensure that you are faithful to the end. It is the will of God that you endure to the end. It is the will of God that you last. That's God's desire. And so that's why he's cultivating your heart, developing your heart, developing your mind. That's why he's sanctifying you of the pride. Pride has been our uh, focus over our uh, Past, over the past few days, we've been focusing on confronting pride, identifying what pride is. It's what the Spirit of God is rebuking. It's what he wants addressed. He wants us to define and to speak against the, the nature of our hearts that separates us from God. Pride is that nature. So it's pride that separates us from God. The, the, the pride that causes us to resist the nature of God, the will of God, the way of God. And so uh, one of the things that we've been talking about as of late is why the Spirit of God gives us the instruction that he does. And so we at our local congregation here in Covington, Georgia, we were talking uh, about Joshua six and seven and eight over the last few months because it can take a while to really delve into to break down and get some good revelation of the scripture to get some good revelation of the scripture we've all uh, because there's a lot that happens between joshua six seven and eight and so you can spend we spent like about, about a month and a half uh, explaining or working through, walking through Joshua chapter 6 and then another month and a half going through Joshua 7 and then maybe a few weeks going through Joshua 8 uh, because again, the Spirit of God is speaking a lot. He's speaking a lot. We know He speaks through His servants. He speaks through situations. So the Lord speaks by His Spirit and he reveals his truth through situations. That means that we can know the will of God by the way things work out if he opens our ears. So if, if our ears are not open to hear the voice of the Lord as things are unfolding, then we won't know what the Spirit of God is saying. We won't know what the Lord is saying. So situations aren't teaching uh, as much as they are communicating. So there's a difference between between being taught and you actually learning something or something being communicated. So power is being transmitted from one source to another. And knowledge is essentially a form of power. So knowledge is a form form of power. It's a form of power. Understanding is a form of power. Wisdom is a form of God's power. And so when uh, knowledge is communicated, when, when, when things happen, when activity is occurring, there are those that can understand what the Spirit of God is saying through the activity. And then there are those who do not understand. They see, but they don't understand. They hear, but they don't comprehend. And so most do not know what the Spirit of God is saying as a result of situations that unfold right in front of their faces. So most cannot hear the voice of God as they are watching events unfold. They can't tell which of these aspects of this activity communicates what. They don't know what's being said 
or 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 communicated or they don't they don't know they, so they're not receiving the necessary instruction as they are watching people do things and watching events unfold so the spirit of god speaks through events just like when jesus would preach he'd use parables so he described events he described activities he would describe who said what and with the masses many times he would not explain the lesson in the activity because the, the because most of the people he was communicating with they were not faithful people and because they were meaning meaning they weren't faithful and they would not be faithful and so only the spirit of god knows who will be faithful and so to many of the unfaithful he doesn't explain things. He doesn't explain things to many of the unfaithful. He lets them see things. And because it's not their will to be faithful, then he won't explain things to them. And he lets them come to their own conclusions. He lets them live based on their own beliefs. And in that, they prove that they're not faithful. But then there are those that he's ordained to be faithful. And he will explain to them what they are seeing or what the father is saying through what they're seeing. And so there are those who can watch things happen and hear that things have happened. And you can know all the stats and all the facts. But if the spirit of God is not explaining to you what you are seeing or what you are hearing, then you are not going you are not in position to make beneficial decisions because only when you possess the truth or only when you understand what the spirit of God is doing can you make decisions that are going to benefit you because the only way to benefit in this life is to obey the voice of the Lord you can't obey what you can't hear you can't obey what you can't hear. And so if we are unfaithful with what we do understand, if we're erratic, if we're unfaithful, if we're ungodly, if we're stubborn, if we're rebellious and aggressive, if, if, if we reject the Lord concerning what, what he does teach us, then he's not going to explain things to us because we are proving uh, that we are in rebellion. So... So the Lord positions people to communicate whether they want more truth or not. Many people want truth, but they don't want to obey what they know. They, they, they want revelation of God's will, more revelation of God's will, but they're not faithful with the measure of knowledge they have. They're not faithful with, with what they do know. And that's how, you know, we can spot hypocrisy. Now, when we disobey what we know, but we want to know more. We disobey what we know, but we want to know more. We're not even faithful with what we know, but we want to know more. We're not faithful with what we do understand, but we want great, we want more explanation uh, for other things as though uh, we, as though we've exhausted the faithfulness that we need to put forth in what we do understand. And the Lord said, if we are faithful with little, he'll give us much. He said that in Luke 16. If if, if you are if you are if you are faithful in the in 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 the little things, he'll make you ruler over great things. And so there are all types of ways in which he preaches that message. So there are those who want more knowledge, but they don't want to obey the knowledge that they do have. So Ecclesiastes, in that book, the Spirit of God reveals that men cannot understand what the Spirit of God is saying by watching events unfold. Pride makes man think he can know the future or understand the present and the past based on watching events. When the Spirit of God enlightens you, when he reveals the truth to you, when the Spirit of God gives you the capacity to understand things, when he does that and you have conversations with people 
who do not have that capacity, you will see the difference between those who are hearing from God and those who are not hearing from God. Those who are listening to the voice of the Lord and those who are not listening to the voice of the Lord. And so many people, they are watching their surroundings. They're paying attention to the surroundings, but they, in hopes that they'll understand what is happening and in hopes that they'll understand what's to come. So they want to know what's to come. Why do we want to know what's going to happen? So that we can prepare ourselves to prosper in the future. You want, you want to prosper in the future. You want to make decisions today that benefit you tomorrow. And so you watch the now. You watch what's happening. You watch what's happening right now. Because in your proud mind, you think that you are capable of making decisions that are going to benefit you in the future. Not knowing that wisdom and understanding are gifts from the Spirit of God. And if he does not grant you comprehension, it doesn't matter what your eyes see or what your ears hear. You cannot make decisions that benefit you because either God is going to bless you for your faithfulness to him or God is going to curse you because of your unfaithfulness. So that means prosperity is not a result of my actions. Failure is not a result of my actions. Prosperity is a result of God's favor on me. And failure is a result of his displeasure. So I can watch whatever I want to watch, phone whoever I want to phone, read whatever I want to read. And, it, and, and it's not going to benefit me to watch and to hear and to have conversations about what's happening if I am out of favor with God. So if, if, if a person is disobedient, and shifty, he's out of favor with God. And God's not going to reveal to him what's happening around him. He'll see it and she'll hear it, but they won't perceive it. They won't understand. And so pride positions us to be confused about what is happening, what did happen, and what will happen. Because pride is the belief that you can control your world as a result of observing it, researching it, and as a result of moving based off of your feelings. It's not, so the word of God is not your basis for why you do what you do. Your thoughts and feelings are the basis of why you do what you do. And that's not going to invite the blessing. It's going to invite the rejection of the Lord. So, the Lord is telling the Hebrews how to prosper. And he's letting them know that prosperity is a manifestation of the favor of God on their lives as a result of their obedience. So he says, obey what I tell you to do, because that's an act of faith. Do what I tell you to do, because if you do what I tell you to do, and God, God, God will tell you to do things that don't make sense to you, that, that, that you think are dangerous, God will tell you to do things that you think are foolish and vain and things that won't benefit you. So uh, we are examining so we so we read the Bible, we, 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 we go over this instruction and this description of these events to hear the voice of God. So when we read the Bible, we read the Bible, the number one reason we should read the Bible is because the Spirit of God commands us to seek Him. 
So he's said some things and done some things that the word of God, that, that the scriptures record. The scriptures record things that the father said and did. And so when we read it, we read it as an act of obedience. And as we read it, what we desire is for him to explain things to us. We, we want to read these records and we're hoping that these records are going to be clear to us. We're, we're hoping that he speaks to us in a way that we can understand. And we're hoping to understand not for the sake of vain honor because people, because knowledge makes, makes, uh, knowledge can make a person think or believe that he's stronger than he actually is. So the belief that knowledge in, uh, is power in that knowledge equips you to make good decisions. That's not true. So, uh, but, but most are going to find out the hard way that that's not true. Most are going to find out the hard way that having knowledge isn't the same as having access to permanent prosperity. Because either God is going to explain things to you or he's not. So you can have a bunch of letters. You can have all the alphabet scramble before you. It doesn't mean that you can make out words. All right. So we read the Bible in hopes that the spirit of God speaks to us and explains to us what he is saying through these words and these actions. So as we hear his voice, we are hoping that his voice imparts devotion to him. Spirit of God, as I read your word, make me a faithful person. As I read your word, may I conform to the instruction released through this document, through this through these writings, God, talk to me. Tell me what to do. Cultivate my mind as I'm reading this. So the word of God says that we ought to observe to do it. So many people do not read the Bible to obey it. We are to read the Bible to obey it. So for those who read the Bible to gain knowledge or simply as obligation without the genuine intent to obey what it's saying, without the genuine, sincere motive to implement the character it's describing that the sons of God are to have, that's going to position us to misunderstand what we're hearing or reading. And misunderstanding causes pain and suffering in the future. If you don't understand God's will, then you can't obey it. If you can't if you don't obey God's will, then you can't benefit from the purpose of God's will. What's the purpose of God's will? The purpose of God's will for man is to unite man with God. So to reconcile man to God. That's the purpose that's that's God's purpose for man. God's purpose for man is for God and man to be one again. Reconciliation, perfect peace. So he speaks to us to unite us with him. He speaks to us to unite us with him. So when he speaks and explains what he's done, then we are in position to be like him. When we apply what he's saying, when you do what he's saying, then you become like him because he reveals what you need to be like him. He speaks to make you like him. So when you hear and obey, you are becoming like almighty God. You were created to become like almighty God. So he speaks to us to make us like him. So we read the Bible. And it explains to us 
what people should do and how people should think. And there's a releasing of power. There's a releasing of power, a releasing of knowledge, a releasing of grace and glory. There's a, so, so the word of God releases the power of God. And we're supposed to be in position to receive that power because it can be released and you could not receive it. So the Spirit of God speaks. He speaks to us to make us like him when we take on the image of what he's saying. So he's speaking to the Hebrews and he's not letting the Hebrews prosper as a result of pride. He's not letting the Hebrews succeed as a result of human effort. He's letting other people succeed as a result of human effort. He doesn't want the Hebrews to succeed as a result of their own human strength. He wants the Hebrews to do things that he tells them to do so that the relationship with him is strengthened so that the Hebrews don't trust in themselves. So the Spirit of God is telling the Hebrews what they need to do to become like him. So we're not simply supposed to hear God's word as a method of, of prosperity or a method of controlling uh, our, our world. We're supposed to hear God's word as access to Almighty God, as access to the Father, as access to the Son, Jesus Christ. We're supposed to hear God's word as a door. God's word is a door. The Spirit of God is calling us to him. The Spirit of God is granting us access to him through his word. And so he speaks his word. Those who accept what he's saying, who believe on him, who commit to him. And you know what? It's, so, it's, so, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a shame that we really can't even say that you need to believe on Jesus. You have to have a whole lot of power from God to preach that you have to believe on Jesus. You can't even preach. You can't even say the word believe on. You can't even use that phrase. You, you, in this generation, you cannot use the phrase believe on Jesus because this is a philosophical, cerebral vain generation. So words like believe, phrases like believe on Jesus are misunderstood because to the modern man, belief is simply academic. It's intellectual. It's superficial. Well, I believe on Jesus. So you can't even preach what Jesus preached like he preached it. You have to use different terminology. And that might throw you off. You might say, no, no, you have to use the same word. There's some words you cannot use unless you have a whole lot of authority. There's some things Jesus preaches you cannot preach and get the desired, the purposed impact because the people don't understand. So the people are so vain. James calls them vain in, in James chapter 2. He says that vain people think that you can have faith without evidence. So vain people think that you can call yourself a Christian and not act like a Christian. So the world is, is getting worse. Unbelief is getting worse. Hypocrisy is getting worse in the world. So people are liars. Men can't even distinguish between male and female genitalia. So how much more, you know, so words like belief don't even... Like, yes, I believe on Jesus. You know, our presidents, the presidents of the United States of America profess to be Christian. Yeah, you know, every president we've had over the last X amount of years have professed Christianity. President Biden, President Trump, maybe President Obama, President Bush. They've all said that they're Christian and they're anti-Christian, some more than others. And that, you know, they were identifiably anti-Christian. They did basic anti-Christian things. You know what I mean? Like honoring Islam. That's a basic anti-Christian move. If you honor Islam, because you, well, why do you honor Islam? Because you preside over Muslims too. You know, you're the governor of the free world, as they call it. 
So you have you you want to honor Muslims. You want to honor the Buddhists. And so if you meet the Dalai Lama, you're going to bow to him. If you meet the, you know, you're going to speak about him as though he's an awesome guy. You're going to speak about Mother Teresa as though she was an awesome woman. You're going to speak about Mahatma Gandhi. You're going to speak about, you know, Muhammad as though he was an awesome man, as though he helped the Muslim people, the Arabs. You, you, and, and those are all lies and that's all evil talk. That's all evil. Everything I just said is evil talk. That's all evil talk. Mahatma and Mother Teresa and the Dalai Lama and Muhammad. Those are all evil people and they're presently in hell. They're in hell right now. They're in hell right now. And so, you know, they're tormenting. They're, they're tormented. They're, they're being tormented because of their rebellion against Jesus Christ. And, and, and pride. Pride. Mahatma and Mother Teresa and Muhammad and 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 and, and the re they, they they did it their way. They 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 tried to control you know, they tried to lead into prosperity without Jesus. Jesus called them thieves and liars. So those people I just named are thieves and liars. But, you know, our presidents feel responsible for representing all of the people of the nation by saying that they too are that. Oh, I'm a Christian, but, you know, as the president, I accept all and everything is good and it's all the same God. Okay, so those are basic anti-Christian positions to hold, basic. If you don't understand that, it's because you have that mindset. If you disagree with that, it's because you have the mindset of Antichrist, and so you don't see any difference. You think that, oh, the president has to say those things. And that's fine. The president may have to say those things, but he's not a Christian. So in this, so, so yeah, the president of the country can embrace culturally or religiously all of these different groups. He's free to do that, not as a believer in Jesus. He can't profess faith in Jesus and profess support for all of these different religious groups. He can profess support for American citizens. He can't profess support for their beliefs and say that he is a believer in Jesus. So you can't even preach belief in Jesus using that term. So the Lord told Jeremiah, tell the people of your generation not to use this phrase, the burden of the Lord. Tell the people of your generation not to use the phrase, the burden of the Lord. The Lord would have prophets use the phrase, the burden of the Lord. It meant that God had given a man of God or woman of God a... Uh, a charge, a heavy responsibility to speak the truth to their assembly. So it was so the burden of the Lord. So these people, the, so false prophets were using that phrase so much. The Lord said, don't use that phrase anymore. So there's some things Jesus preached that false prophets have used so much that false brothers have used so much. You can't even use that phrase anymore. You can't even you you can't even say, you can't even simply say that people should believe on Jesus. You got to have a whole lot of power from Jesus to say you need to believe on Jesus. Because so so most of us cannot use that phrase without explaining it in great detail. So you might as well use another phrase. So you, you know, you might as well use another phrase. You have to use words like commit. You have to use words like dedicate your whole life. Phrases like dedicate your whole life. Yeah, man. Oh, you have to dedicate your whole life to Jesus. Yeah, you have to surrender your entire... You have to... Oh, 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 yeah. So, yeah, you have to commit to him with your whole life, your mind, your soul, your strength. You have to use extensive phrases to communicate belief because people in our generation misunderstand what it is to believe on Jesus. So if the Spirit of God gives you lots of power and lots of authority, then you can, say, you can say simple things that Jesus said and the Spirit of God flow through what you're saying with such grace and force that people understand what you're saying. And when you say believe on Jesus, it's very different than when a thousand of those other guys say believe on Jesus. Paul says, we are not as many 
which corrupt the word of God. So Paul was making it clear that most people who preach Jesus are corrupt and they preach Jesus out of pride. There's a pride, there's an ignorance, there's a hypocrisy, there's a rebellion, there's a greed, there's a lust, there's a confusion and that they're controlled by, they preach from the perspective of confusion, from the perspective of pride, from a position of hypocrisy, they're out of the will of God, just yet they're preaching Jesus. And so they're preaching from a place of pretense. Paul said, that's what most are doing. They're, most, are, most who are hearing the word of God and preaching the word of God are falsely teaching it. They're false teachers. Paul says, we are not as, that's not, we are not like that. He was able to make that statement boldly. He was able to boldly distinguish himself from the others. From many, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. But as of sincerity, we preach it in sincerity. We preach it with sincerity. We're not preaching it like others are preaching it. He was able to make that clear. He wasn't speaking as a result of pride. He was speaking as a, as a result. He was speaking truth he was speaking truth from a point of truth no it's true that many are in perversion they, they are in perversion and they are speaking the word from a perverse position of heart and mind that's not what we're doing that's not what we're doing and you say well those people say that that's not what they're doing what's the difference between them and you, and it's clear, if you cannot tell, then that's your problem. He makes that clear, and you need to understand that. What is the difference? So, so you don't know? God's not talking to you. Paul said, it is clear. Paul said, we can clearly distinguish between the false guys and the real guys. And if you cannot... He says, the God of this world has blinded your mind. And that's why you cannot distinguish between when a guy is lying to you and when a person is preaching the truth. He says, oh, you don't know? If you can't tell, it's because the God of this world has blinded your mind, preventing you from seeing with clarity the, the difference between the true preachers of Jesus and the liars. So that's reality. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. He says, if people embrace my ministers, they are embracing me. And if they accept me, they're accepting the one who sent me. So he's preaching to those who reject him. And he says, why can't you understand what I'm saying? It's because you are not my sheep. You are not my sheep. That's why you can't tell the difference between the real preachers and the false preachers. So some heard him and said, this man is the savior of the entire world. Others heard him and said, this man is a deceiver and he is the child of Satan. And Jesus didn't sit there and go through why He's not a child of Satan extensively. He just kept saying more things. More things that they'd not understand. And as he's doing that, those who do understand are getting richer and richer in knowledge and power. So as he's preaching to, th to those who are not going to understand him anyway, and they're getting angrier and angrier, the righteous are hearing him. And they're getting happier and happier because he's imparting more life to them. Every time he opens his mouth, he's imparting life. And they are soaking it up. And these people are like a brick wall. And it doesn't matter that he's speaking the truth. They can't hear it. That woman at the well, she could hear. Though she was out of the will of God, she could hear him. She could hear him. 
And Jesus told Nicodemus, you should be able to understand what I'm saying. And if you cannot understand what I'm saying, you are worthless as a teacher. You wor you're worthless. I, you need transformation. You need transformation. So Jesus' words aren't for the purpose of indoctrination. Jesus' words are for the purpose of sanctification. So he speaks to us. So we are shifted and changed in our minds. And so our comprehension in righteousness grows. And we begin to make godly decisions. So the Lord is constantly talking to us. And we cannot be governed by our emotions. We cannot be governed by our emotions. There are lots of things that we are going to retain access to. Lots of good things you're going to retain access to if you submit to the leadership of the Spirit of God. So we are supposed to submit to the leadership of the Spirit of God to, re to retain access to the Spirit of God. You might want access to Jesus, but you have to obey him to retain access to him. So Jesus wants us to obey him because it doesn't matter that you don't want to go to hell. You have to obey the voice of Jesus. You have to obey. Your obedience is your voice. Your obedience is your statement to God. I love you and I don't want to die in sin. I want to serve you in righteousness. Not just your words. Your words have to correspond with your works. James says those whose words don't correspond with their works. Those are vain people. So it's true. You have to believe on Jesus. And belief on Jesus is demonstrated by your total dedication to him. Yeah. And you can't be a liar. You can't be a liar like those in your generation. So most of the people in your family and in your city and in your state and at your schools and at your jobs, most of them are liars. Most of them are liars. Some of them are nicer than others. They are liars. All right. If Jesus is not their absolute focus, and if they don't see their world from the perspective of the voice of Jesus, they're liars. That's what Jesus is revealing. That's what Jesus is revealing. And that's why he treats them as though there's no God and as though life is just randomly dangerous, just spontaneously treacherous that's yeah that's how god treats people god treats people like there like there are no law like that as if you are damned if you do and you are damned if you don't yeah because he scorns them because they are scorners like yeah it seems like there's no direction to life because they don't want direction he doesn't give it to them you don't want direction you want entertainment and so jesus it doesn't want to entertain people i don't want to entertain you I'm here to save you and you want entertainment. So entertain yourself. Go, go and entertain yourself. So if you don't want to commit to righteousness, I'm not going to entertain you. I'm not going to tell my sons and daughters to speak to you words of truth because you don't want the truth. You want lies. So find some people to lie to you about life. Because that's what you want. And when disaster comes, cry. Because it's going to come. And it's going to hit you without your ability to prepare for it. So we don't want to live that life. We don't want to be treated like old newspaper or chaff blown in the wind. That's not what we want to be treated like. You know? So the Lord is telling so the Lord tells us what we need to do to prosper. He tells us what we need to do to prosper. And that instruction can be very very strange. Why so the Hebrews are commanded to 
take over a region that is occupied. So these people are already living in this region. There are people already living in the region where the Hebrews are told to take over. The Hebrews are told to remove these people, go to this region and kill off the ones that live there and live there. The Spirit of God has blessed the region to be very fertile. And that area makes the Lord happy. And he wants happy people to live in a happy place. So the Spirit of God wants good people to live in good places. And he wants bad people to live in bad places. Places that are not fertile. Places that are not safe. He wants bad people to live there. And he wants good people to live in good places because that's just, it's right. So the, the Canaanites, they worship false gods. They serve devils. They sacrifice their kids in fire to these false gods. And so the Lord, but the Lord blesses the land. It's a really good fertile region. It's got precious metals in the ground and in the hills and it's a very fruitful and a blessed place so god wants the hebrews to live there god wants the hebrews to live there in case you didn't know as it relates to priority that region of the globe is god's favorite place so the area where the nation of israel is that's the spirit of god's favorite place you cannot go there now in this generation and be and please the Lord. You can't go to Jerusalem right now and please the Lord unless he specifically commands you to go to Jerusalem. Verb, like he has to tell you by his spirit mightily to go there. So though it's a place that pleases God because he's planted his power there. He's planted power there. Now, he's put power elsewhere, but he's planted his power there. It's where he's going to live. It's where he's going to live. So, it's a blessed place in that the people of the world do not have access to that blessed place as God has blessed it anymore. So, he's sealed that place. He's locked the blessing. So the believer who lives in Ontario, Canada, can't take a trip to Jerusalem just to visit where Jesus was and receive the blessing that Jesus wants him to receive as if he were to stay himself in Ontario. Where are you from? You're from Vancouver? Well, do a good job in Vancouver. But I'd like to go to Jerusalem. Why do you want to go to Jerusalem? Because that's where you were. That's where you did all kinds of great things. That's true. Don't worship what I've done. Don't worship what I've done. Don't worship what I do. Don't come to your, don't come to your own conclusion about what I want. This is a major matter here. Hear my voice. Don't take a flight and just go and see because you're not going to see what you think you're going to see. I have a friend. Oh, you see this? Look at this. This is a phone, right? This is a phone. And in my phone, I've got an app. I've got an app. This is an app. It's an app. All right. That's an application. And on this app, I've got a friend that we do not, I don't communicate with him. And on this, see that right there? So this friend of mine is, um, he was, maybe is, in the military. And so we began to converse when? On, Mar on May 24th, 2017, we began to converse. So that's me right there. And so on May 24, 2017, I, uh, I, 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 I reached out to him because he reached out to me. And so we were beginning to converse. And he told me he was in uh, Beersheba or Beersheba. So 
these pictures of him. That's he's in Israel. He's in Israel. I said, man, I want to go to Israel. So, he's, so this picture right here, that's him in Israel. That that he's he walked me through Israel on the Sabbath day. That's that is right. He walked me through Israel on the Sabbath day. I said, oh man, this picture here. It's a Sabbath day. He walked me through Israel on the Sabbath day. He said, yeah, man. He said, I'm in Israel right now. He said, he said, uh, you don't want to come to Israel. He said, it's not what you think. He said, the Roman Catholics, the Orthodox Jews, and the Muslims, he said, this place is full of idolatry. It's been given to the Gentiles. It's what Jesus said in Luke 23. Jesus said that. He said that their house was left to them desolate. Is it Luke 23? Yeah. He already said that. Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. Don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. Because the time is going to come when they're going to say, uh, bless to the women who didn't have children and who never breastfed anyone. Because their kids are going to be killed in the judgment that God brings on this place. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kills the prophets and you stone those who come to you. You know, I, I would have met, I would have healed you, but you didn't want to be healed. Your house is left to you desolate, meaning I'm withholding power from you. It's there. Nobody has access to it. I've got purpose for the region, but if the believer wants to enjoy God by going to Jerusalem, he's saying the, the opposite of what you think will happen will happen. He's saying if you go to that place hoping to get a greater connection with God or an understanding of where God worked and how God did, he's saying that's not what it is. You can go there all you like. I'm not going to talk to you in a clean way. But we've got some brothers who are teaching us Hey, if you want to hear from God, you got to go to Israel. But Jesus said not to do that. Now, listen, Jesus can tell that brother and that sister, go to Israel. I want to speak to you. Yeah, Jesus can tell you. He can tell me. He can tell them, go to Israel. I want to talk to you. And you can go to the airport and book your flight to Israel. And go there and let the Lord speak to you. Yeah. But you can't tell the other brothers, hey, brothers, the Spirit of God told me, go to Beersheba and go to Nazareth and hear from him. So because he told me that, that's what he wants for you all in the body. So if you want to hear from God, get up and go. No, you can't go there because he's going to curse you. As a result of disobedience, because he's cursed the area. He calls that place Sodom and Egypt. Presently, we, where did you find that, Brother David? We found that in Revelation 11. He says, No, 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 no. That place is Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Where was Jesus crucified? right outside of the gates of Jerusalem. A few steps from the gates of Jerusalem. That's where Jesus was put to death. And so he calls that place Egypt and Sodom. That's what he says about it. Right now to this day, he calls it Egypt and Sodom. So for you to go there, you'd be going to a place that the Spirit of God calls spiritually Egypt and Sodom. That's where you'd be going. So you can't go there to please God. Doesn't it make sense to go to where God did his most work to please him? Yes, it makes sense to you. But your brain can't be a basis for why you do what you do in reference to life. That's what it says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path, right? So you say, Brother David, I need some anointing oil. Should I get some from Jerusalem? 
You should not get anointing oil from Jerusalem just because it comes from Jerusalem. If it comes from Jerusalem and that's where you're getting it from, fine. Get oil from Jerusalem. Get a shirt that they produce in Jerusalem, made in Israel. Fine, fine. Don't get it because it's from Israel. Don't get it because it's from Jerusalem. Thinking you'll have more access to Jesus. Go to the Publix or the Walmart or the Kroger or the Rite Aid or the Pathmark or the whatever else nearest to you and get you some extra virgin olive oil and ask the Spirit of Grace to sanctify it and anoint yourself or have someone who has authority anoint you with it. Yes, just do it. You don't have to get the special oil from the special city of Sodom or the special city of Gomorrah or the special city of Egypt, the nation of Egypt. No, you don't have to do that. So the Lord will tell us to do things as a basis for, he'll tell us to do things to strengthen our relationship with him. The Spirit of God will tell us to do things to develop our faith. All right, you Hebrews, I want you to take over this region. It's a blessed, a fertile region. It's a blessed region. It's a fertile region. My eyes are always on this region from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. That's what he was doing. Was. W-A-S. That's what he was doing. He's paused that level of affection. He's paused that level of affection for that area. And so that area is a strategic place for the workings of the Spirit of God. Not for man to say, Jesus worked there. Let me go there. The, 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 the reason why the Roman Catholics and the, and the Orthodox Jews... Mm -hmm, uh, not so much the Orthodox Jews, but the Roman Catholics and the Muslims and other false religions want to make that their central place is because they heard that God worked there. So when the Spirit of God does mighty things in a particular region and then stops doing that, because the Spirit of God will do wonderful things in an area and that will attract opposition from the devil because the devil wants to confuse and pervert the way of God and the work of God and so he'll fight against it and he'll try to confuse people concerning it. So, and he'll try to capitalize on the strength and power that God put there because the, the devil is a thief. He's a thief and a murderer. You can't murder unless you find someone living, right? So the devil is after the living. He finds the living and he goes after them because he's a murderer. The devil finds valuable things and tries to get it because he is a thief. He finds truth and he tries to confuse concerning it because he is a liar. So he is a liar. That means he's always trying to distort truth. He is a thief. So he's always looking for the valuable so as to steal it, the valuable thing. And he is a murderer. So he's looking for the living so as to, to attack them. So that's what he does. He's driven. He's driven by that. And that's why the sons of God have to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Because you are valuable. You are truth. And you are life in Christ Jesus. You are all that. You are valuable. You are worthy. You are truth. And you are valuable. And so you're going to attract Satan. You're going to attract the support of the Spirit of God. And you are going to attract Satan. And when he comes, you are going to need the full armor of God to subdue him. Oh, I know I'm valuable. I know. But where is my value? My value is in Christ. I, you obey Jesus and he, he equips you to defend yourself from the murderer, the liar, and the thief. Oh, he's coming to distort my my path. Yeah, so you have to, you need power to shut the lion's mouth. You need power to break the teeth of the ungodly. You need Psalm 91 to tread on the serpent and on the adder. That's what you need to, to tread the, the, the lion and the young lion. You need to step on them. Yeah, you have to 
brutally subdue the enemy. You don't, we don't chase demons. We don't chase them per se. My, 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 my dad used to be a part of this ministry back in uh, New York. It was called Demon Chasers. Listen, I understand. I understand. If, you know, if, if they're rising up and you're driving them out and you want to call them demon chasers or, 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 or ghost busters, hey, listen, do it. If that's what you want to do, do it. You know, just make sure that you, you know, you're doing it in righteousness according to the will of God. But, you know, because if, you, if, you, if you're doing it in the flesh, then you'll be the one that'll be demon chased. And so, uh, uh, and so we don't chase demons. We chase Jesus. And if the demons get in the way, then you, you know, you run them over. That's what you need grace to do. We obey Jesus so that as we're chasing him and pursuing him, when the devil rises up, you can stiff arm him. Some of you have played football. And it's one thing just to run someone over. It's another thing to stiff arm them. Hey, what are you doing? Well, I'm here to stop you. No, you're not. You're here to receive the laying on of hands. I'm here to lay hands on you in a violent way. Get out of my way. You know what I mean? And you're going to get him with the sword of your mouth. Get out of the way. I'm going to, you know what I mean? You're going to like stiff arm the devil, but you can't stiff arm him if you're in agreement with him. You're running after Jesus. You're chasing Jesus. The devil rises up. Hooga booga. You know what I mean? Tries to attack you. And you, you let him know you're not pleased with his being a, being a distraction. Hey, I, I'm not pleased with you being a distraction. Oh, me, I'm not a distraction. I'm your friend. Bang! You just catch him. Stiff. You just catch him. You give him whiplash. Make him wish he didn't rise up against you. No, man. No, 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 no. You don't, you don't want to be in my direct path. You want to run alongside me. Maybe you can try to grab my leg or something. Don't get in my face. You know, I'm just going to do that to you. And you, you do that with the word of God. You do that. You, write, you know, you focus on Jesus and he tries to put crazy thoughts in your head and you rebuke those demons. You rebuke the devil and tries to make you do bad things. He tries to tell others to do bad things and you confront him. Like, listen, the word of God is like a hammer. It's going to break the rock in pieces. Yeah, it's like a fire. I'm going to... Speak this word. The Lord told Jeremiah that. Jeremiah 5, 17. And because you speak this word, I will make my words in your mouth fire. And the people will be like wood. And it will devour them. Yeah. Peter spoke that word and it devoured his audience. And they had to prove that they were murderers. And many of them died that day. Not physically. They died in the spirit. They killed Stephen. And they indicted themselves. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So... Stephen's going to get a quick trip to heaven as he loses consciousness and goes to be with Jesus. And these men are going to have their names signed in another book. Not the book of life. The book of death. Yeah, they're going to have their... Yeah, they're, no, they're, write, no. Write down they did that. Write that down. Yeah, they're going to, that's what they're going to do. They devoured them. He spoke that word. They didn't want to hear it. They rose up, took him outside, stoned him. Stephen said, Lord, forgive them. Don't lay it to their charge. That's Stephen's declaration of mercy. God's going to lay it to their charge, many of them. Not that one guy way out there, Paul, who's in agreement with his stoning. But, you know, God's not going to lay it to his charge. But the rest of these guys, most of these guys, they're going to hell. They're going to hell. That's, that's you know, they signed a death certificate. Let his blood be on us. And our children, oh, so yeah, wow, you just, man, huh, really? Yeah, I want Barabbas. All right, well, you can have him, you can have him. Released unto them who for sedition and murder was cast into prison and delivered Jesus to their will. Well, what should I do with Jesus? Crucify him. We don't have any king but Caesar. It's the government. We worship the government. Oh, yeah, well... Pilate's going to wash his hands, even though God's still going to indict him for it. He's going to wash his hands. God's still going to hold him accountable for it. He's not going to let him off the hook just because he washes his hands. He just doesn't have as great of a condemnation coming on him as the Jews do on them. Yeah. The Lord indicted Herod in that, Pilate in that, and these people in that. And they got the greater sin. 
And so what we want to do is hear and obey the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to hear and obey the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Lord tells these Hebrews, he gives them instruction and he tells them to encircle Jericho once a day and on the seventh day encircle it seven times. Well, why? Because the Lord wants to promote you and promotion is, 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 is available to the obedient. Now, listen, we know that promotion is going to be available to lots of people, but promotion is going to benefit the faithful. So God's going to promote a lot of people. Many thousands of Hebrews are going into this new land, but who gets to benefit from promotion? So the obedient get to benefit from promotion. God is giving you access. Who gets to benefit from from the access God is giving you. So God's going to give you things. He's going to give you access to things. Are you going to benefit from the fact that he's going to give you power and knowledge? Or are you going to show yourself as a vain person? So the Lord tells the Hebrews, I want you to do this. I want you to do this. And if the Hebrews obey, if the Hebrews obey, the Hebrews are demonstrating Submission to God's authority. They're demonstrating faith. They're demonstrating trust in the Lord. Lord, I trust you. How do you know you trust the Lord? You obey his voice, even when his instruction seems as though it's dangerous to obey. So you are denying yourself. You're spiting your proud mind that tells you that you know right from wrong, apart from Jesus. So your mind tells you to do something. The Lord tells you to do the opposite. And you deny yourself, take up your cross, and you obey Jesus. You follow Jesus. You do what Jesus did as he tells you to do it, as he explains it to you, as he reveals it to you. Remember, you can read your Bible all day and night. If the Spirit of God doesn't give you understanding of what his expectations are for you, then... You're not going to be able to obey the instruction there. You are to hear those set over you from the Lord. Brother David may not be the main guy set over you, but you need to find the main guy set over you and obey him as he obeys Jesus, right? Some of you, I'm the main guy God set over you. Others, I'm not the main guy. You need to find the main guy and submit. Because if you do, that guy is going to be uh, uh, an usher. He's going to be a doorman. He's going to open the door to Jesus for you. It's his job. It's his job to be a, a light and a guide. And he's going to point you in the right direction with his words and his behavior. And he might be in Yellowstone National Park, that's my, that might be where he holds his meetings, and, and he might be uh, up in, I don't even know, Poughkeepsie, New York, or he might be down there in, I don't even know where else he could be. He could be in some places, though. You know, he could be, he, he could be, he could be, some, he could be in some places. And so, you got, you know, the Holy Ghost will lead you if you are a faithful person. The Lord will lead you to those who can lead you deeper and further into Christ Jesus. And so it doesn't matter that the world is growing in hypocrisy and the numbers of hypocrites is increasing. The Lord is still speaking by his spirit and through his servants. And if we conform to his will, we are going to prosper. We need courage to conform to his will. We need boldness. We need courage. We need hope we need trust to, to obey i think this is going to happen if i make that decision you might be wrong because most of your thoughts are not the lord's thoughts so you might be wrong about what you think is going to happen if you do this and say that but if you are doing what you were told to do then you are not going to be wrong you are even if you experience some adversity initially you are not going to be wrong if you are doing what the Spirit of God has been telling you to do and has blessed you for doing in the past. 
And that's the way of life. That's the way of life. This is David Williams. And our information for Jesus Ministries is above, beside, or below this video. And may God give you ears to hear and a heart that obeys what we just talked about.